Pilate was not conscious of the absurdity of his pretense, that to have washed his hands and to have charged the Jews with the blood of Christ was sufficient to clear him before his conscience and before men. For by this ceremony, so full of hypocrisy and deceit, he tried to satisfy both. It is true that the Jews were the principal actors and more guilty in the condemnation of the innocent God-man, and that they themselves expressly charged themselves with its guilt. But Pilate was not on that account free from it, since knowing the innocence of Christ our Lord, he should not have allowed a thief and robber to be preferred before Christ. Neither should he have chastened nor pretended to correct him, who showed nothing that could be corrected or amended. Luke 23:25. Much less should he have condemned and delivered him over to his mortal enemies, whose envy and cruelty was so evident. He is not a just judge who is aware of the truth and justice and places it in the balance with his own human respect and his own personal interest, for such a course drags down the right reason of men who are so cowardly of heart. Since they do not possess the strength and perfection of mind necessary to a judge, they cannot resist their greed or their human respect. In their blind passions, they forsake justice in order not to endanger their temporal advantages, as happened to Pilate. In the house of Pilate, through the ministry of the holy angels, our Lord was placed, or I'm sorry, excuse me, our queen was placed in such a position that she could hear the disputes of the iniquitous judge with the scribes and priests concerning the innocence of Christ our Savior and concerning the release of Barabbas in preference to him. All the clamors of these human tigers she heard in silence and admirable meekness as the living counterpart of her most holy son. Although she preserved the unchanging propriety and modesty of her exterior, all the malice, all the malicious words of the Jews pierced her sorrowful heart like a two-edged sword, but the voices of her unspoken sorrows resounded in the ears of the Eternal Father more pleasantly and sweetly than the lamentation of the beautiful Rachel, who, as Jeremiah says, was beweeping her children because they cannot be restored. Jeremiah 31, 15 Our most beautiful Rachel, the purest Mary, sought not revenge but pardon for her enemies, who were depriving her of the of the only begotten of the father and her only son. She imitated all the actions of the most holy soul of Christ and accompanied him in the works of most exalted holiness and perfection. For neither could her torments hinder her charity, nor her affliction diminish her fervor, nor could the tumult dist distract her attention, nor the outrageous injuries of the multitudes prevent her interior recollection. recollection. Under all circumstances, she practiced the most exalted virtues in the most eminent degree. Instruction which the great mistress of heaven, most blessed Mary, gave me. My daughter, in what thou hast written and understood, I see thee astonished to find that Pilate and Herod exhibited less unkindness and cruelty in the death of my divine son than the priests, high priests, and Pharisees. And thou dwellest much upon the fact that those were secular and Gentile judges, while these were teachers of the law and priests of the people of Israel, professing the true faith. In answer to thy thoughts, I will remind thee of a doctrine not new, which thou hast understood on former occasions, but I wish that thou refresh it in thy mind, and remember it for the rest of thy life. Know then, my dearest, that a fall from the highest position is extremely dangerous, and the damage done is either irreparable or very difficult of redress. Lucifer held an eminent position in heaven, as regards both natural gifts and gifts of grace. For in beauty he excelled all the creatures, and by his sin he fell to the deepest abyss of loathsomeness and misery, and into a more hardened obstinacy than all his followers. The first parents of the human race, Adam and Eve, were exalted to the highest dignity, and raised to exquisite favor, as coming forth from the hand of the Almighty. Their fall caused perdition to themselves, and to all their posterity. And faith teaches what the cost of their, what was the cost of their salvation, to restore them, and their posterity was the work of an infinite mercy. 
Many other souls have reached the heights of perfection and have thence fallen most unfortunately, arriving at a state in which they almost despaired or found themselves incapable of rising. This sad state in the creature originates from many causes. The first is the dismay and boundless confusion of one who feels that he has fallen from an exalted state of virtue, for he knows that he has not only lost great blessings, but he does not expect to obtain greater ones than those of the past and those he has lost, nor does he promise himself more firmness in keeping those he can obtain through renewed efforts than he has shown in those acquired and now lost through his, his ingratitude, ingratitude. From this dangerous distrust originates lukewarmness, want of fervor and diligence, absence of zeal and devotion, since diffidence extinguishes all these in the soul, just as the sprightliness of ardent hope overcomes many difficulties, strengthens and vivifies weak human creatures to undertake great works. Another obstacle there is, not less formidable, namely, the souls accustomed to the blessings of God, either through their office as the priests and religious or by the exercise of virtues and the abundance of divine favors as spiritual-minded persons, usually aggravate their sins by a certain contempt of these very blessings and a certain abuse of the divine things. For by the abundance of the divine favors, they fall into a dangerous dullness of mind. They begin to think little of the divine favors and become irreverent, thus, <clears throat> thus failing to cooperate with God's grace. They hinder its effect. <clears throat> Excuse me. They lose the grace of holy fear of the Lord, which arouses and stimulates the will to obey the divine, the divine commandments and to be alert in the avoidance of sin and pursuit of eternal life and the friendship of God. This is an evident danger for lukewarm priests who frequent the Holy Eucharist and other sacraments without fear and reverence also for the learned and wise and the powerful of this world, who so reluctantly correct and amend their lives. They have lost the appreciation and veneration of the remedial helps of the church, namely the sacraments, preaching, and instruction. Thus, these medicines, which for other sinners are so salutary and counteract ignorance, weaken those who are the physicians of the spiritual life. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are other reasons for this kind of danger which must be referred to which must be referred to the Lord Himself. For the sins of those souls who, by their state or by their advanced virtues, are more closely bound to their God, are weighed in the balance of God's justice in quite a different way from the sins of those who have been less favored by His mercy. Although the sins of all are more or less essentially the same, yet the circumstances of sin are very different. For the priests and teachers, the powerful and the dignitaries, and those who, on account of their station or by reputation, are supposed to be advanced in a holy life, cause great scandal by their fall or by any sins they commit. There is much more of bold disrespect in their presumption and temerity against God, whom they know better and to whom they owe much more but whom they offend with more deliberation and knowledge than the ignorant. Hence, as is evident from the tenor of all the Holy Scriptures, the sins of Catholics, and especially of those that are instructed and enlightened, are so displeasing to God. As the term of each man's life is preordained for each one as the time in which he is to gain the eternal reward, so the measure or number of sins to be borne by the patience or forbearance of the Lord is likewise preordained. This measure of divine justice is determined not only by the number and quantity of the sins, but also by their quality and weight. Thus, it may happen that in the souls favored by greater enlightenment and graces of heaven, the grievousness supplies what is wanting in the number of the sins, and that with fewer sins they are forsaken sooner and chastened more severely than others with many more sins. Nor can all expect for themselves the same issue as David and St. Peter, because not all of them have to their credit as many good actions to be remembered by the Lord. Besides the special privileges of some 
cannot be set up as a rule for all others, because, according to the secret judgments of the Lord, not all are destined for a special office. By this explanation, my dearest, thou wilt be able to satisfy thy doubts, and thou wilt understand what a bitter evil so many souls incur, whom the Almighty has redeemed by his blood, placed in the way of light and drawn toward himself, and how some persons can fall from a more exalted state into more perverse obstinacy than others below them in station. This truth is well illustrated in the mystery of my son's passion, in which the priests, scribes, and the whole people were much more indebted to their God than the heathens who knew not of the true religion. I desire that this truth, as exhibited by their example, convince thee of this terrible danger and excite in thee holy fear, and with this fear join humble thanks and an exalted esteem of the favors of the Lord. In the days of abundance be not unmindful of the hour of want. Ecclesiastes 13.25 Ponder as well the one as the other within thyself, and remember that thou carriest thy treasure in a fragile vessel which thou canst easily lose. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Know well that the reception of such blessings argues not merit, and the possession of them is not due to thee in justice, but comes to thee by liberality and kindness. That the Most High has favored thee with so much familiar intercourse is no assurance that thou canst not fall, and no license to live carelessly and without reverence and fear. All things happen to thee according to the number and greatness of thy blessings, for the wrath of the serpent has increased towards thee in proportion, and is more alert against thee than against other souls. He has become aware that the Most High has not been so liberally loving to men of many generations as towards thee, and if thou meet so many blessings and mercies with ingratitude, thou shalt be most wretched and worthy of a rigorous punishment against which thou canst make no objection. Our Savior, by order of Pilate, is scourged, crowned with thorns, and mocked, the behavior of the Most Holy Mary during this time. Pilate, aware of the obstinate hostility of the Jews against Jesus of Nazareth, and unwilling to condemn him to death, of which he knew him to be innocent, thought that a severe scourging of Jesus might placate the fury of the ungrateful people and soothe the envy of the priests and the scribes. If he should have failed in anything pertaining to their ceremonies and rites, they would probably consider him sufficiently chastened and cease in their persecutions and in their clamors for his death. Pilate was led to this belief by what they had told him in the course of his trial, for they had vainly and foolishly calumniated Christ of not observing the Sabbath and other ceremonies, as is evident from his sermons reported by the evangelists, John 9, 6. But an ignorant, but Pilate was entirely wrong in his judgment, and acted like an ignorant man, for neither could the master of all holiness be guilty of any defect in the observance of that law, which he had come <clears throat> not to abolish but to fulfill. Matthew 5, 7 Nor, even if the accusation had been true, would he have deserved such an outrageous punishment, for the laws of the Jews, far from demanding such an inhuman and cruel scourging, contained other regulations for atonement of more, the more common faults. In still greater error was this judge in expecting any mercy or natural kindness and compassion from the Jews. Their anger and wrath against the most meek master was not human, not such as ordinarily is appeased by the overthrow and humiliation of the enemy. For men have hearts of flesh, and the love of their own kind is natural, and the source of at least some compassion. But these perfidious Jews were clothed in the guise of demons, or rather transformed into demons, who exert the more furious rage against those who are rendered more helpless and wretched, who, when they see any one must most helpless, say, Let us pursue him now, since he has none to defend him nor free him from our hands. Such was the implacable fury of the priests and of their confederates, the Pharisees, against the author of life. For Lucifer, despairing of being able to hinder his murder by the Jews, inspired them with, it, with his own dreadful malice and outrageous cruelty. 
Pilate placed between the known truth and his human and terrestrial considerations, chose to follow the erroneous leading of the latter and ordered Jesus to be severely scourged, though he had himself declared him free from guilt. John 19, 1. Thereupon, those ministers of Satan, with many others, brought Jesus, our Savior, to the place of punishment, which was a courtyard or enclosure, enclosure attached to the house and set apart for the torture of criminals in order to force them to confess their crimes. It was enclosed by a low, open building, surrounded by columns, some, some of which supported the roof, while others were lower and stood free. To one of these columns, which was of marble, they bound Jesus very securely, for they thought him a magician and feared his escape. They first took off the white garment with not less ignominy than when they clothed him therein in the house of the adulterous homicide Herod. And loosening the ropes and, ch and loosening the ropes and chains which he had borne since his capture in the garden, they cruelly widened the wounds which his bonds had made in his arms and wrists. Having freed his hands, they commanded him with infamous blasphemies to despoil himself of the seamless tunic which he wore. This was the identical garment with which his most blessed mother had clothed him in Egypt when he first began to walk, as I have related in its place. Our Lord at present had no other garment, since they had taken from him his mantle or cloak when they seized him in the garden. The Son of the Eternal Father obeyed the executioners and began to unclothe himself, ready to bear the shame of the exposure, exposure of his most sacred and modest body before such a multitude of people. But his tormentors, impatient at the delay which modesty required, tore away the tunic with violence in order to hasten his undressing, and as is said, flay the sheep with the wool. With the exception of a strip of cloth for a cincture which he wore beneath the tunic, and which his mother likewise had clothed him in Egypt, the Lord stood now naked. These garments had grown with his sacred body, nor had he ever taken them off. The same is to be said of his shoes, which his mother had placed on his feet. However, as I have said on a former occasion, he had many times walked barefooted during his preaching. <clears throat> I understood that some of the doctors have said or have persuaded themselves that our Savior Jesus, at his scourging and at his crucifixion, for his greater humiliation, permitted the executioners to despoil him of all his clothing. But having again been commanded under holy obedience to ascertain the truth in this matter, I was told that the Divine Master was prepared to suffer all the incense, all the insults compatible with decency, that the executioners attempted to subject his body to this shame of total nakedness, seeing to despoil him, seeking to despoil him of the cincture which covered his loins, but in that they failed, because on touching it their arms became paralyzed and stiff, as it happened also in the house of Caiaphas when they attempted to take off his clothes. Oh, that's such a good thing to know. At the six, all the, all the six of his tormentors separately made the attempt with the same result. Yet afterwards, these ministers of evil, in order to scourge him with greater effect, raised some of the coverings. For so much the Lord permitted, but not that he should be uncovered and despoiled of his garments entirely. The miracle of their being hindered and paralyzed in their brutal attempts did not, however, move or soften the hearts of those human beasts, but in their diabolical insanity they attributed it all to the supposed sorcery and witchcraft of the author of truth and life. Thus the Lord stood uncovered in the presence of a great multitude, and the six torturers bound him brutally to one of the columns in order to ch chastise him so much the more at their ease. <laughs> then two and two at a time they began to scourge him with such inhuman cruelty as was possible only in men possessed by Lucifer, as were these executioners. The first two scourged the innocent sa Savior with hard and thick cords full of rough knots, and in their sacrilegious fury strained all the powers of their body to inflict the blows. This first scourging raised to the deified, in the deified body of the Lord great welts and livid tumors, so that the sacred body gathered beneath the skin and disfigured his entire body. Sacred blood gathered beneath the skin and disfigured his entire body. 
Already it began to ooze through the wounds. The first two, having at length desisted, the second pair continued the scourging in still greater emulation. With hardened leather thongs, they leveled their strokes upon the places already sore and caused the discolored tumors to break open and shed forth the sacred blood until it be bespattered and drenched the garments of the sacrilegious torturers, running down also in streams to the pavement. Those two gave way to the third pair of scour scourgers, who commenced to beat the Lord with extremely tough rawhides, dried hard like osier twigs. They scourged him still more cruelly because they were wounding not so much his virginal body as cutting into the wounds already produced by the previous scourging. Besides, they had been secretly incited to greater fury by the demons, who were filled with new rage at the patience of Christ. As the veins of the sacred body had now been opened, and his whole person seen but one continued wound, the third pair found no more room for new wounds. Their ceaseless blows inhumanly tore the immaculate and virginal flesh of Christ our Redeemer, and scattered many pieces of it about the pavement, so much so, so that a large portion of the shoulder bones were exposed and showed red through the flowing blood. In other places, also, the bones were laid bare, larger than the palm of a hand. Oh, poor, poor Jesus! In order to wipe out entirely that beauty which exceeded that of all other men, Psalms 44, 3. They beat him in the face and in the feet and hands, thus leaving unwounded not a single spot in which they could exert their fury and wrath against the most innocent lamb. The divine blood flowed to the ground, gathering here and there in great abundance. The scourging in the face and in the hands and feet was unspeakably painful, because these parts are so full of sensitive and delicate nerves. His venerable countenance became so swollen and wounded that the blood and the swellings blinded him. In addition to their blows, the executioners spirited upon his person their disgusting spittle and loaded him with insulting epithets. Epithets. E p i t h e t s. I'm not sure how to pronounce that word. The exact number of blows dealt to our Savior from head to foot was five thousand one hundred and fifteen. The great Lord and author of all creation, who, by his divine nature, was incapable of suffering, was, in his human flesh and for our sake, reduced to a man of sorrows, as prophesied, and was made to experience our infirmities, becoming the last of men. Isaiah 53, 3. A man of sorrows and the outcast of the people. The multitudes who had followed the Lord filled up the courtyard of Pilate's house and the surrounding streets, for all of them waited for the issue of this event discussing and arguing about it according to each one's views amid all this confusion the virgin mother endured unheard of insults and she was deeply afflicted by the injuries and blasphemies heaped upon her divine son by the jews and gentiles when they brought jesus to the scourging place she retired in the company of the marys and saint john to a corner of the courtyard Assisted by her divine visions, she there witnessed all the scourging and the torments of our Savior. Although she did not see it with the eyes of her body, nothing was hidden to her, no more than if she had been standing quite near. Human thoughts cannot comprehend how great and how diverse were the afflictions and sorrows of the great Queen and Mistress of the Angels. Together with many other mysteries of the Divinity, they shall become manifest in the next life, for the glory of the Son and Mother. <clears throat> I have already mentioned in other places of this history, and especially in that of the Passion, that the Blessed Mother felt in her own body all the torments of her son. This was true also of the scourging which she felt in all the parts of her virginal body, in the same intensity as they were felt by Christ in his body. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to try to make my videos 25 minutes. All praise, glory, and honor be to our Savior, Jesus Christ.